Great, so we're gonna go ahead and, and get started. I just wanted to uh, welcome everyone to the webinar. My name is Tom Lindsay. I'm an attorney and senior legal counsel for the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights. This is our first webinar of 2022. Uh, a lot of interest in this uh, case, the first rights of nature case filed in the United States. Uh, and as they used to say on airplanes, at least, if this, that's not your destination, it's time to get off and get on a different plane. But that's where we're headed. Let's talk about this Orange County, Florida case, first rights of nature and uh, enforcement case in the United States. Uh, so we're going to do a deep dive today, a kind of a workshop on this first rights of nature enforcement case that's been filed in the U.S., uh, in which waterways in Florida are seeking to enforce their legal rights against a proposed development in Orange County, Florida, that will destroy wetlands and harm waterways. The case is captioned, i.e. the title is Wild Cypress Branch versus Beachline and the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, Beachline being a developer attempting to put in a 1900 acre uh, housing commercial development in Orange County uh, and the Florida Department of Environmental Protection being the state agency that is uh, and has permitted uh, the uh, development to move forward. The plaintiffs are the affected waterways, so wetlands, uh, streams, uh, so the affected waterways themselves as plaintiffs, we're going to talk about what that means. Uh, and Chuck O'Neill, who's an environmental advocate from Orange County, uh, who's joining us today, and we'll get to uh, his introduction, the introduction of our other uh, speaker uh, in a moment. So before we introduce the presenters, uh, a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, during the presentation, everybody is welcome to submit questions in the chat, uh, in the chat box off to your right. We'll collect those and ask them during the question and answer part of the webinar, and there will be two of those. Uh, we're going to be doing a, a PowerPoint. Uh, to start with that covers the basics about this particular case so that our presenters don't have to uh, dive back into that material, but we present the how, the what, uh, the when, the where, that, that kind of stuff in the PowerPoint. Uh, and I would ask people to be patient. We have a lot of non-lawyers with us today, so the PowerPoint was done specifically for that uh, uh, constituency in mind. So we'll move slowly through it, but uh, it's uh, kind of to take out those basics before we have a conversation with uh, Steve and Chuck. Uh, other housekeeping notes, we'll keep everyone's microphone muted uh, during the time. Uh, so again, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. We will get to those questions uh, right, before, right after the PowerPoint. So if you have questions about the PowerPoint, please put them in chat. Uh, we'll answer those basic clarifying questions after the PowerPoint is over. And then we'll have a chat, uh, which we'll use for question and answer for our two presenters uh, today as well. Uh, as noted a couple of minutes ago, the webinar is being recorded and will be available online. Uh, we take it, edit it, put it in uh, you know, web um, appropriate uh, uh, format, and then we will have it up on our website at the Center for Democratic Environmental Rights for folks who wanna watch or circulate. Uh, information on how to keep up to date on this case and the general topic, which is rights of nature. Uh, we're going to put that into the chat box now. And so if people want to follow the case or want more about rights of nature, Mari, our executive director, has put up uh, that information in the chat box now. So uh, let me introduce our presenters today. Uh, we have Chuck O'Neill, Steve Myers, and then I'll be facilitating the PowerPoint uh, presentation uh, today. I'd like to introduce Chuck O'Neill. Uh, Chuck O'Neill is a resident of Orange County, Florida, and president of the conservation organization known as Speak Up Wakaiva, named after the Wakaiva River in Orange County. Uh, Chuck is one of the plaintiffs in this first rights of nature lawsuit on behalf of waterways affected by this 1900 acre proposed housing and development, uh, housing commercial development in Orange County. Uh, Chuck was one of the primary advocates for the adoption of the Orange County Right to Clean Water Law, which was adopted by 89% of the vote in 2020, November of 2020 in Orange County, Florida, and which established the legally enforceable rights of waterways in Orange County. In doing so, those 89% of the voters in Orange County, 89% uh, of the vote, um, made Orange County the largest municipality in the United States. Uh, a, a million and a half residents to adopt a rights of nature law uh, in the US. Uh, and Mari has typed in the Speak Up Wakaiva, a website, speakupwakaiva.com uh, for the Speak Up Wakaiva organization uh, that Chuck is president of. Our second presenter is Steve Myers. 
Uh, Steve is a civil trial lawyer in Florida with the firm of Myers and Stanley in Orlando. Uh, he was on the legal team in 2015 to stop the Florida uh, black bear hunt and has represented multiple environmental groups to stop the destruction of forests and waterways in Central Florida. He represents Chuck and Orange County Waterways as the plaintiffs uh, in this rights of nature lawsuit uh, that's been uh, filed in Orange County, Florida. Uh, so without further ado, uh, we're gonna come back to our two presenters after the PowerPoint, uh, but we want to use the PowerPoint as a background on this case kind of the, you know, the what, who, what, who, where, 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 and how. Uh, so I'm gonna start us off with that short PowerPoint. It's about 20 slides to cover the basics of the case. And again, if you have questions as we're doing the PowerPoint, please put them in the chat box. We'll curate them and I'll get to uh, answer them after the PowerPoint is uh, complete. So sharing screen now with the uh, PowerPoint. Uh, titled The First Rights of Nature Case Filed in the United States. This is the caption or title of the litigation. Wild Cypress Branch versus Beachline South Residential LLC and the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. It was filed in 2021 in Orange County, Florida. And again, Wild Cypress Branch, one of the plaintiffs, there are other waterways as plaintiffs, versus, versus Beachline South Residential LLC, that's the development corporation. Uh, which is proposing to put in this 1900 acre development. And of course, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, uh, which has permitted, uh, issued a permit uh, for the wetlands destruction, which will occur as a result of this project moving forward. So the PowerPoint is loosely grouped into three categories. We're going to look at the law that gave birth to the litigation in the first place. Then we're going to look at the project itself. The lawsuit contends that the project itself violates that law that's in place in Orange County. And then we're going to look at some of the particulars of the case itself in terms of procedure and filing where it sits today before we uh, turn it over. I'll turn it over to Mari uh, so that she can facilitate a conversation with Steve and Chuck. Okay, we are moving. So this is the case again, Wild Cypress Branch versus Beachline South Residential. So two questions come up. Why was the case brought? What is the case about? That's what we're gonna to cover today with the PowerPoint. So we're gonna start off in Florida, again, for people that don't have a background on Florida law. And Florida law is not so much different than many other states in the United States, but Florida has these things called home rule charters. So many Florida counties, many Floridas and count, uh, many counties in Florida have these charters under which the people of these counties can make law, uh, essentially change these local constitutions. So these aren't ordinances or just regular local laws. These are charters, which are akin to local constitutions for those municipalities. And again, most states have these things called charters, uh, but basically uh, these are uh, local constitutions that counties have created. Uh, states generally have legal frameworks allowing those counties or municipalities to pass these home rule charters. And states have provided tools by which either residents or county selected individuals sitting as commissions can actually change or amend these local constitutions. So Orange County, Florida has one of these home rule charters they're known as a home rule charter local government in Florida. And they provide for a charter commission to review proposed amendments to the charter every four years and decide whether to submit those amendments to a popular vote. So one of the methods for changing charters uh, is through these charter commissions in which in Florida, at least the county commissioners appoint a certain member of uh, members to serve on the charter commission their job is to review these charters to make sure they're up to date uh, and uh, capture evolving developments in municipal law. Uh, and they draft, they're responsible for drafting these amendments and then deciding whether to submit those to a ballot uh, for a popular vote on election day so that people can vote on whether to make those amendments part of those charters or not. So again, home rule charters, uh, most uh, home rule communities provide for some kind of mechanism to amend those charters. In Orange County, they have this mechanism where every four years, a new charter commission comes together, proposes new amendments, and then those amendments are placed on the ballot. It's important to note that those amendments that are drafted by the charter commission don't become law 
unless they're adopted by popular vote. So they have to actually go on the ballot uh, and then uh, be voted in by the, by the voters that show up at, on election day. So in 2020, our presenter today, Chuck O'Neill and Speak Up with Kaiva, uh, submitted an amendment to the Charter Commission in Orange County, Florida, to recognize the Wakaiva and Econ Lakatchee rivers in Orange County as having certain rights. So essentially to recognize the rivers as having these elevated or um, civil rights akin to civil rights type protections within Orange County. And we'll talk more about where that idea had a genesis, uh, but in Orange County, Chuck and Speak Up Wakaiva submitted an amendment a proposed amendment to the Charter Commission to consider about whether to protect those rivers in Orange County with those rights-based protections. The Charter Commission uh, decided to take that proposal and actually integrate it into their process for deciding whether to amend the Orange County Charter or not. And they actually expanded the amendment beyond the Wakaiva and uh, Econ Lakatchee rivers uh, to all waters of Orange County. So not just the rivers, but all waters, you know, wetlands, rivers, tributaries, uh, streams, uh, all of the waters of Orange County and produced a draft uh, declaring uh, in, that, in that amendment that not only that the waters of the county would have the right to quote exist flow to be protected against pollution and maintain a healthy ecosystem, but that the citizens of the county also had a right to clean water. So uh, two principles in this charter amendment, one that citizens of the county have a right to clean water, a legally enforced right to clean water, and second that the waters of the county themselves have rights, and the rights are listed on that PowerPoint slide, the right to exist flow to be protected against pollution and maintain a healthy ecosystem. In June of, of 2020, the Charter Commission voted to place the proposed amendment on the ballot, and again, 89% of the vote in Orange County uh, went towards approval of the initiative. For anybody who's worked on ballot initiatives, that 89% number should really stand out because uh, generally you're lucky to get something passed by 52 or 53%, uh, but it goes to show you that this proposal at least really crossed party lines uh, in Orange County. So what did the initiative say? Well, it provided those two rights, a right to clean water for residents, citizens of Orange County. Uh, it also recognized rights uh, for those, for the waters of Orange County. So not just the rivers, but the waters. Uh, there was also an enforcement provision within the charter amendment that all citizens of Orange County shall have standing to bring an action in their own name or in the name of the waters to enforce the provisions of the section of the charter. And then it went through language about where to file such an action. Uh, but this provision specifically recognized that citizens of the county had standing to bring an action in their own name or in the name of the waters. So a plaintiff being the Wakaiva River, for example, uh, but that had a choice about how to bring the case. And then the rest of the verbiage was about which court to bring the case uh, in or which court could entertain jurisdiction for the case. Now, this concept of waterways having rights or waters having rights, kind of strange to a lot of people, but generally falls into this category of rights of nature laws. And this push and pull between Western culture and kind of an indigenous understanding of nature, Western culture seeing waterways and ecosystems as property uh, to be owned or used uh, for uses to be permitted uh, on that property. Uh, but these rights of nature laws really establish legally enforceable rights for nature, species, and ecosystems. Uh, rights of nature law has been adopted by six tribal governments in the U.S., 30 municipal, over 30 municipal governments now in the U.S., and in Brazil and Canada. People may have tracked uh, just last year, first rights of nature law in Canada was passed by an indigenous uh, government as well as a municipal government in Quebec to protect the Magpie River in Quebec, but the first, first one passed in Canada last year. The concept of rights of nature has been embedded in the Ecuadorian constitution, uh, which we provided some assistance on as the constitutional process was evolving there back in 2008. Uh, national laws in Bolivia and Uganda, uh, and in court rulings in Ecuador, Colombia, India, and Bangladesh. And just a note there is that in Colombia, India, and Bangladesh, uh, those court rulings have moved forward without any written law. So no national or constitutional written provisions, uh, but instead uh, moving forward uh, by uh, judges. So judicial precedent moving forward to 
uh, capture this rights of nature concept to recognize the Atrato River in Colombia, the Ganges River in India, all rivers in Bangladesh as having certain rights under the law. And also just a, a side note, the Sauk Suatl tribe uh, in Washington state recently filed another enforcement action on rights of nature seeking to get a court to declare that salmon uh, have certain rights as a species. So again, no written law, but using customary or unwritten uh, law to move forward that particular court case in Washington state. So again, these rights of nature laws have a pedigree. Uh, some of that pedigree was built into the Orange County, Florida proposed uh, charter amendment uh, that was placed on the ballot. So that's the background on, on the law itself that was passed in Orange County, Florida. And now we'll move to the project itself, which is known as the, sounds very pleasant, the Meridian Parks Remainder Project. Uh, and this is what the project is and what its impacts would be. It uh, proposes construction of a 1900 acre housing and commercial development um, in Orange County. So 1900 acres uh, for housing and commercial development. Some of the impacts, uh, dredging and filling over 114 acres of wetlands for, for the development, uh, roadways and for stormwater ponds uh, as part of that development. And the project uh, as on paper at this point would adversely impact Wild Cypress Branch, Boggy Branch, Crosby Island Marsh, Lake Park, Lake Mary Jane uh, through dredging, filling and through pollution. Uh, also through uh, construction of impermeable surfaces which would contribute to runoff into those waterways. And those named waterways here are actually some of the named plaintiffs in the case. Uh, they're uh, waterways protected by the Orange County, Florida Charter Amendment, their right to exist, uh, and those other rights that we saw that were embedded in the Orange County Charter. Just to give a bigger picture scope on the loss of wetlands in Florida, uh, Florida has lost the most wetland acreage of any state in the US. We're talking 9.3 million acres or 46% of Florida's original wetlands. So a lot of concern over waterways, a lot of concern over habitat, a lot of concern over loss of wetlands uh, and other uh, natural ecosystems uh, in the state of Florida because of the amount of acreage, uh, especially of wetlands that's been lost in the state. To uh, put this project in, the developer, Beachline South Residential, needs a dredge and fill permit. Uh, dredge and fill permits are kind of a specialized permit uh, that are generally controlled by the Federal Clean Water Act. If you're going to dredge and fill wetlands, you need a dredge and fill permit as required by the Federal Act, Clean Water Act. And as of January 1st, 2021, authority to issue those permits was delegated from the federal government to the state of Florida. So a lot of people don't, don't know about this particular area of the law because it hasn't been used very much. But during the Trump administration, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency uh, decided to delegate authority over issuing these dredge and fill permits in this particular case down to the state of Florida. The state of Florida had applied to the federal government to actually be the primary reviewer and issuer of these dredge and fill permits. And uh, the administration allowed them to do so starting, they had made the application earlier in December, but starting on January 1st, 2021, authority to issue these permits was delegated from the federal government to the state of Florida. It was not, however, without controversy that that occurred because it's happened so little over the past 10 years that it's unusual for the federal government to delegate authority down to a state to basically administer a federal uh, permitting process and federal permitting review, but that's what happened. And in response, a lawsuit was filed uh, by the, as the plaintiff was the Center for Biological Diversity, there were other environmental plaintiffs as well, uh, but a lawsuit challenging the delegation of that Clean Water Act permitting authority from the federal government down to the state of Florida. And basically the lawsuit contends that Florida has a lesser standard than the federal government to issue the permits and therefore violating the Clean Water Act itself uh, because the Florida proposal to administer these permits uh, are not as stringent as the federal Clean Water Act regulations are. And so the Trump administration saw fit to delegate down to the state of Florida, even though their standards in issuing these permits were less than what was required at the federal level. And what they're doing, what this case is seeking is a nullification of that federal delegation, which would void all the permits issued by the state. 
And the reason we're talking about this particular case is, number one, the delegation was not without controversy. But number two, in our particular case, this case, Wild Cypress Branch, it builds on this, uh, part of it builds on this lawsuit uh, because it says you shouldn't be issuing a permit because the entire permit process may be declared to be illegal. So one other thing to know before we move into the content of the actual lawsuit is that following the Orange County Charter Commission's placement of the Orange County Amendment onto the ballot, uh, the state legislature voted to preempt the passage of any law which recognized rights for ecosystems or the natural environment. So this becomes important because it's part of the lawsuit, but again, uh, right after the Orange County Charter Commission voted to place the Charter Amendment onto the ballot, the state legislature in Florida adopted a statute which attempted to stop it uh, from happening uh, and also stop any other municipality, any other local government from actually doing the same thing that Orange County has done. So preempting the passage of any law which recognizes rights for ecosystems or the natural environment. And this was the particular language uh, Senate Bill 712 uh, passed, uh, was introduced in 2020, uh, and this is the language. A local government may not recognize or grant any legal rights to a plant, an animal, a body of water, or any other part of the natural environment that is not a person or a political subdivision as defined by Florida law. This is Senate Bill 712. It was passed by the legislature, signed into law by Governor DeSantis, uh, and uh, we should note it's part of a recurring theme around rights of nature laws, not just Florida, it's also occurred in Ohio, uh, where a bill was introduced to preempt or prohibit uh, local municipalities from passing rights of nature laws. Uh, and we'll talk more about this in the conversation that we're gonna have with Chuck and Steve, uh, because it becomes a key point in the litigation. So uh, turning to the lawsuit itself, again, lawsuit is captioned Wild Cypress Branch, there are other plaintiffs, other waterway plaintiffs, as well as Chuck uh, as a plaintiff in this case as well. Uh, but keep in mind waterways as the, as the plaintiffs versus Beachline South Residential, the developer, and also the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. So who are the parties in this case? What are the causes of action? And what's the current status of the litigation? So plaintiffs and defendants. Plaintiffs are Wild Cypress Branch, Boggy Branch, Crosby Island Marsh, Lake Hart, Lake Mary Jane, and a category of all other affected county waters. So all other county waters affected by this particular 1900 acre development. Uh, and, and Chuck O'Neill, our, one of our guests today on behalf of the waters. So as a guardian or trustee of the waters, and also as president of Speak Up Wakaiva, which of course has an interest uh, in the health and welfare of waterways, particularly the Wakaiva River within Orange County. Defendants include Beachline South Residential LLC, which is the development corporation which has proposed the 1900 acre development, and the Secretary of the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Reason for that is that the Florida Department of Environmental Protection is the permitting agency, uh, which has now released or issued this dredge and fill permit uh, for the development corporation to destroy the wetlands uh, within uh, the proposed development area. So there are six counts in the complaint. There's only really uh, three areas for us to look at. So uh, we're gonna do this one and the other two. The first two counts deal with water rights. So the rights that are given to waters are recognized on behalf of waters within the Orange County, Florida Charter Amendment. Uh, that the lawsuit contends have been violated or will be violated by the Meridian Parks remainder, remainder project moving forward. So uh, for the developer to build the development, it would violate the rights of waters. Uh, so all the plaintiff waterways that are suing would violate their rights uh, to exist flow, be protected from pollution and maintain a healthy ecosystem. So it, this particular account seeks a declaration from the court so basically a statement of law that the development project, if it moves forward as planned, will violate these rights of Orange County waters. Count two is related to count one because it moves beyond just a statement of law. It actually seeks an injunction from the court to stop the project uh, on the basis that it violates the rights of water. So count one and count two go together. Uh, count one is the statement of law that's being asked uh, from the court. 
And count two is the injunctive relief asking for an injunction to actually stop the project on the basis of what's being requested in count one. Count three and four of the six counts also go hand in hand. Uh, they focus on the human right to clean water uh, that's embedded within the Orange County, uh, Florida charter. Uh, and it seeks a, a statement from the court, a declaration, declaratory judgment, that the project itself and the permit violate the right to clean water possessed by Orange County citizens. So again, just to remind you, the Orange County Charter Amendment has two heads to it. One is uh, protecting the right to clean water possessed by people, the Orange County citizens of Orange County. And the second one is the right of uh, waters. So the right of those waters, uh, the rights of those waters within the Orange County Charter Amendment. These counts focus on human right to clean water. And count four is similar to count three in that it seeks an injunction to stop the project on the basis of what's being argued in count three. So these two go together. So again, count one and count two focus on water rights. So the rights of the waters and waterways. Count three and four focus on the human right to clean water uh, and both to get a declaration from the court as well as injunctive relief. Count five and six kind of stand by themselves. Uh, count five is that the state preemption statute is unconstitutional, that the state of Florida does not have the constitutional authority to actually preempt local governments, uh, municipalities, including counties, from passing laws which recognize legally enforceable rights of ecosystems and nature. So it seeks a declaration with the court, again, a, a statement of law uh, that the state's attempted preemption of the Orange County law is unconstitutional and illegal. Uh, and again, the complaint needed to get into this material because otherwise the state legislature's action would make this lawsuit meaningless because the state has attempted to preempt this law that's been passed by Orange County. And finally, count six, uh, this is why we talked about the Center for Biological Diversity's lawsuit uh, is a, uh, the uh, plaintiffs in this case are also asking for a temporary injunction to freeze the permit issuance uh, until this other case winds its way through the courts. So until the case challenging the uh, federal government's delegation of permitting power to the state, until that's resolved, what this complaint argues is that it makes sense to freeze this permit and freeze the development in place. In other words, stop, uh, remove any permissions, but also uh, cease the development from moving forward until that parallel case has wound its way through the courts. Because otherwise you could have the state issuing permits that are null and void. Because if that delegation case is successful, then all the permits issued under that degraded Florida scheme for issuing dredge, dredge and fill permits, uh, all of those would be deemed illegal and uh, thrown out because they were issued under that lower standard of review. In a nutshell, what relief is being sought through the lawsuit uh, is to uh, uh, declare that the Meridian Parks Remainder Project and the state's issuance of a dredge and fill permit for the project would violate the rights of waterways as well as the rights of Orange County citizens as secured by the Orange County Home Rule Charter and enjoin the project and the issuance of the permit. So there's a lot in that sentence uh, but this is the overall 30,000 foot scope of what the lawsuit is attempting to do. Uh, it's to declare that the project itself uh, would violate the rights of waterways as recognized by the Orange County Charter, as well as the rights of Orange County citizens also recognized by the Orange County Charter and get the court to stop the project and overturn the issuance of the permit that's been issued by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. And as part of that, declared the state acted unconstitutionally legal in trying to block the adoption of the Orange County Charter Amendment. So declare that the state is constrained from preempting municipalities like Orange County from moving forward to adopt these kinds of rights of nature laws into their charters uh, or other mechanisms of law within uh, the county or other municipalities. So that's the big picture here. All the details kind of are important, but not important. Uh, but this is the big picture uh, issue here is trying to stop a project that's going to violate those two sets of rights. One set of rights dealing with the rights of waterways, another set of rights dealing with the rights of Orange County citizens to clean water uh, and uh, to permanently enjoin the project as a violation of those rights. 
So procedurally, where do we sit? The case was filed in the circuit court of the Ninth Judicial Circuit, uh, Orange County, basically a state-based court uh, sitting in, in Orange County uh, as part of the Florida court system. Lawsuit was filed on April 26, 2021 uh, in that court. Uh, on July 13th, uh, there was a motion to dismiss filed by the corporation, by the developer, and by the state of Florida. They were essentially contending that the lawsuit was not ripe because a permit hadn't issued at that point. They were saying it's premature, permit hasn't issued, you don't have standing to bring a lawsuit because the permit hasn't issued. If the permit hasn't issued, then the developer can't move forward with the project yet. So it's not concrete at this point, and you would have to sue later, uh, but a permit hadn't issued. And also that the state's preemptive state law uh, foreclosed the bringing of the action because it prohibited rights of nature laws from being passed and therefore it preempted it preempted uh, this particular lawsuit, as well as other municipalities passing similar laws. Uh, the plaintiffs filed an amended complaint on October 24th, basically to respond to that constitutionality issue, uh, and also to integrate this Center for, for Biological Diversity case into the lawsuit to talk about why the permit needed to be frozen uh, because of that overall challenge to the federal delegation of, of dredge and fill permitting down to the state government. So again, plaintiffs uh, filed an amended complaint on October 24th, which resets the whole process. Basically a new filing resets the litigation process. And now the developer uh, and uh, the state of Florida filed a new motion to dismiss on January 4th. Uh, the plaintiffs are preparing to file a response to that motion to dismiss, which will be filed on February 14th. Uh, and a, a hearing has, has been scheduled in April. Steve can talk more about this piece uh, to hear that motion to dismiss as well as any other relief motions that are filed in the interim between now and that uh, case date. So that's the case management schedule uh, that the case is operating under. Uh, and again, the key dates there are February 14th for plaintiff's filing and then or argument to be held in April. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it back, uh, turn it over to Mari Margill, our executive director at the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights. Uh, and she is going to talk uh, to Steve and Chuck, ask questions about the implications of the case uh, and the broader application of rights of nature laws in Florida. And again, Steve is an attorney for the plaintiffs in the Wild Cypress Branch litigation. And uh, Chuck is one of the plaintiffs in the Wild Cypress Branch litigation, also uh, represents the waterways. Uh, in that capacity as well. Turning it back over to Mark. Thomas, thank you so much um, for that. I, we've had a few questions in the chat just to clarify um, your presentation before we get into conversation with Chuck and with Steve. Um, the main question that was asked was, was there a consideration um, in terms of this case, in terms of filing it possibly in federal court? instead of in the state court. Yeah, I can let Steve uh, talk more about that when we when we get to that section, but generally the federal courts are not don't have the jurisdiction to hear these kinds of cases generally because you have to have a federal claim, a federal constitutional claim or a claim arising under the US Constitution or a federal statute. And generally the federal courts aren't a forum for these kinds of lawsuits. So that's why it was filed in the state court. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for the presentation. And so just as a reminder for everyone, this is being recorded. Um, so you'll be able to watch this again, reference it if you want to. We also have other materials from this case available um, and we'll make the PowerPoint available again too. I'm hearing my volume is too low. So let me turn that up. Um, please let me know if that's not good enough. Okay. So we're going to start with Chuck. Um, and Chuck, you have been involved in this from really the very beginning of conceiving of a law in Orange County to recognize rights of waterways um, and the right of people to healthy waterways. So can you just begin with telling us why it was important to you um, to bring a new law, to propose a new law, to work through that? about how, why and how that happened? Sure, Mari. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank you and Thomas for having Steve and I on to talk about this. 
issue. And <clears throat> from the, the turnout, you can tell that there are a lot of people who are concerned about this. And wh why is that? Uh, why are we concerned about this case? And I think it boils down to a search for truth. Uh, three square miles of forested wetlands versus a toaster. A toaster is considered property, personal property. Uh, these forested wetlands that provide solar powered water filtration, they're a habitat for wildlife. They're, they're a, a, an unbelievable source of a, a carbon sink in a time where we need to really look at, at, at what we're doing to uh, curb climate change. Uh, all these things come together in this case because um, uh, we under current Florida law consider that forested wetlands are basically have the same rights as a toaster. You own the toaster, uh, it performs a function, uh, you can beat the toaster with the hammer, you can do whatever you want to destroy it. Somebody buys this piece of property, three square miles of forested wetland, this is their property, they get to do whatever they want with it. Uh, in, in the search for truth, I think it comes down to the core being of every person listening to this and every person who will listen to this. Is it just, is it right that uh, this kind of uh, equivalence exists in our law? And if it isn't, how do we begin to change it? And what we did here in Orange County is to begin to change the thinking, to begin to build a body of law in the state of Florida that recognizes nature as having other rights, special rights, not just property, uh, something that should be regarded and uh, treated as uh, something different than just uh, a piece of property. So uh, that's, that's why we um, work towards passing the uh, charter amendment in Orange County and to begin to I, I know uh, there are probably a lot of people who are not familiar with rights of nature on this call. And when they listened to Thomas's initial uh, PowerPoint presentation, their minds were blown, just as my mind was blown back in, uh, I believe, 2013 when I first heard him speak. And also when I heard Mari speak uh, to the Bioneers uh, 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 on, on YouTube. Uh, and if you haven't heard that speak, speech, you should uh, really. Uh, Google it and uh, listen to it. Thank you for that. You know, as was mentioned earlier, um, the initiative to recognize the rights of waterways in Orange County, it passed overwhelmingly. I mean, almost 90% of people in Orange County voted in favor of it. Can you you know, for those of us particularly who aren't in Florida and aware of all of the water worries there, can you give us a sense of the context for that and why do you think it was passed so overwhelmingly? Yeah, I, I, I don't think there was anybody more surprised at the 89% than, than I was. Um, we were hoping to get 51%. But what, what happened through, as Thomas mentioned, this went through the Charter Review Commission process we initially proposed a solely um, rights of nature um, amendment to the uh, Orange County Charter. And through the process, there were three attorneys, a, a UCF biology professor and a retired NASA engineer who were on that, that panel. Uh, over the course of seven months and 11 different meetings, this evolved into a pairing of both rights of nature and human rights, the human right to clean water. Uh, and I think that's what made it so successful, Mari, is it resonated with people, especially people who are suffering from uh, degraded uh, 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 waterways, degraded springs, degraded uh, water quality. Uh, we, we see it every day here in, in the state of Florida and, and when we put it to the voters as a right to clean water. Uh, and we had 
support from not, not just one political party. We had support across the board from, from uh, Republicans, Democrats, uh, NPAs uh, across the board. And you don't get to 89% with uh, uh, multilateral support like that. So I think it resonates with people. It's timely. Uh, we were accused of being uh, radical. This was a radical environmentalist group that was putting this forth. And uh, uh, I agree with them. It is radical. And that's exactly what we need. We need change. The Latin word for root is radix. And that's where radical comes from. We need change at the root level. I think all parties agree that the system is broken. This uh, uh, prevailing uh, legal uh, uh, con concept that nature is just property like any other uh, toaster or whatever, that that is wrong, it's not true, and we need to move towards truth. So the work that you've done and continue to do is speak up with Kaiva, with the Florida Rights of Nature Network, with the case that you and Steve are working on here. I mean, that obviously has gained quite a bit of attention across Florida, I mean, across the country as well, and internationally. The Florida legislature responded um, and passed a preemptive law um, that preempts local communities within the state from passing rights of nature laws. And that happened during the course of time in which the Orange County law was being considered and was put on the ballot for voters. So can you speak a little bit to that? Because that's a, that's a really remarkable political dynamic that happened, I would say, fairly quickly um, when your work really started gaining steam within the state that the state legislature responded so aggressively. Yeah, it, it did happen quickly. Uh, the, uh, I think March 4th, 2020, the Charter Review Commission, all 15 members voted on uh, whether this should go to the ballot or not. And I, I believe it was the next day, the uh, legislature voted to preempt uh, the rights of nature, uh, preempt any local government from passing any kind of uh, ordinance that recognized the rights of nature. Uh, so, you know, that really makes you feel special, right? When uh, the Florida legislature uh, it targets you individually um, and spends, uh, you know, their precious time trying to stop you from uh, cleaning up their uh, the waterways that they have all the legal responsibility to maintain. They have all the power. They have the agencies, the Department of Environmental Protection. They have uh, the water management districts. They have the Department of Health. This is their responsibility. So when a local government, such as Orange County, tries to do something to uh, proactively to, to clean up the waterways, uh, the legislature steps in and, and says, we, that we can't have that. that, that that's, our, that's our responsibility. Well, if it is their responsibility, then they need to get to it. They need to get going. We have crises around the state with water quality. We have manatees dying in the Indian River Lagoon. We have, we have wildlife dying off the West Coast. We have red tide. The Coosahatchee River has been turned into an open sewer. Uh, all these things are the responsibility of the state. And if the state legislature would act responsibly, they would encourage local governments to take charge and seek ways to uh, clean up our waterways, but they responded uh, in, in the way you mentioned with the uh, preemption, which I think just goes to show where, they're, where their head's at, where, where, what do they think is important? And what they think is important is to not spend the dime to clean up the water in the state of Florida, because one of their uh, cronies, the, the members that put them there, the organizations that put them there, uh, uh, they don't want to see that. They don't want to spend a dime towards that effort. But, but in the end, clean water is good for business. And business should not be an obstructionist to uh, get to the point where we have clean water again in this state. They should be behind it, not in opposition. 
Jeff, thank you. And my understanding is um, that there was a bill introduced to repeal the preemption law. And it was introduced in the legislature. I don't believe that it has moved far yet. Um, and perhaps it will be reintroduced in the new session. Um, correct me if I'm wrong there. But I, I want to, before we get to Steve, um, just want to, what you've just said puts me in mind to sort of take a big step back um, in this case, which is just so you know, we can say it out loud. Um, you know, what we're talking about here is a case um, in which Orange County passes a law and then brings a case to enforce the rights of the waterways. And that was found to be necessary because you were just talking about the state legislature. The state government itself has issued a permit to destroy wetlands within Florida. I mean, plain and simple, that's what's happened. The environmental agency in Florida issued a permit to destroy wetlands and gave that authority to a corporation. When, you know, 9 million acres of wetlands across Florida, the Boston last century and a half, when you had all sorts of um, impacts on waterways, as you said, particularly with species extinction, water pollution, all sorts of things. Um, and yet we still have environmental agencies, you know, in Florida and elsewhere, providing legal authority to corporations to, to purposefully destroy the environment. Can you speak just, you know, quickly about, I mean, what kind of dialogue is happening among people in Florida about that? Do they, are they, is it that clear to them about what's happening? I, I think it's becoming more and more clear as each day goes by, as we see the headlines and the, the, the bodies wash up on beaches uh, of, of manatees and uh, other, other wildlife, massive fish kills around the state. People know that there's something wrong. There's something very wrong in this state. And when you have an organization like the Florida Wildlife Commission uh, do a press call that say, okay, well, yeah, we do have massive fish kills all along the, the West Coast, but we have an East Coast and you can go over there and fish over there. It's, it, it's really an abuse of the, the, the power of the state government to, to not recognize, number one, the actual uh, harm that's being done around the state through their uh, poor implementation of, of laws that have already been written, and then blocking local efforts around the state. Uh, so this is, this is the, the, uh, the, the state, literally, this is the state we're in, right? Welcome to Florida. And, and you know, the, the one great thing that I'd like to, to end on, Mari, is, is with your help and with Thomas's help <clears throat> uh, and with, with the, all the, the great people in, in the Florida Rights of Nature Network uh, around the state that we are moving the needle here. We're moving forward. They're trying to do everything to block us, but now we're, we're heading into uh, the beginning of a, of a constitutional amendment campaign to change the law, to go over the heads of the legislature to the voters of the state. And, uh, you know, the course of legislature is, is trying to do everything possible to stop that and to have another law uh, that they're trying to get, put this in front of the voters to, to stop ballot initiatives like ours. But uh, the, the reality is that there is a search for truth going on. Uh, I think we've, we've the 89% shows that we've, hit on something that the voters uh, really want and respect and understand and that we will not stop, uh, you know, and if we have any legislators uh, uh, on the, on the uh, call today, uh, we're not going to stop. And we are, we are headed straight to the voters using the citizens initiative process in, in the state of Florida. Uh, and we will let them, decide ultimately the fate of the rights of nature in Florida and the fates of our waterways. Chuck, thank you. Um, and thank you for the work that you're doing. We're going to turn, Steve, it's to you now um, to talk a bit more about the case specifically. Uh, one is Thomas presented that motion to, to dismiss this case has been filed by the state and by the developer. Um, can you help us understand what their arguments are asking the court to dismiss this case? 
Yeah, sure. And I want everybody to understand that we make no apologies. Um, we're not coming into this lawsuit with any sense of we're radicals, we're fringe people. The starting point in our case is that the current regulatory system is completely an epic failure. And as Chuck mentioned, we have you know hundreds of dead manatee carcasses floating in our intercoastal. 50% of the uh, significant water bodies in Orange County are impaired by the state's own classification. The Little Wakaiba River dried up this past year. There was literally no flow. Um, and the judge will know that. And one thing that we have that they don't have is that there's no argument that the current system is working at all. It's been a complete failure. It's indefensible. And hopefully, we can try to get them trying to defend that. Um, and what they're doing, like they always do, is they're falling back on the current system of laws and the current regulatory scheme, which is a complete failure. And it's important that everybody understand this tension between um, the state regulatory scheme where everything is funneled, these, these water issues are funneled up to Tallahassee to the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, which is an industry captured agency. No serious thinking person believes that the Florida Department of Environmental Protection is actually in any meaningful way trying to uh, help our waterways and doing anything that significantly helps the waterways. It, they're, they're not. It's complete industry capture. So um, with respect to the lawsuit, um, you know, the, the developer and the state DEP really have four main arguments, um, standing, express preemption, the, our failure to exhaust administrative remedies and something related that's called the primary jurisdiction doctrine. So standing is just, you know, the concept that in order to bring a lawsuit, you have to have an injury, you have to have, there has to be causation, it has to be related to the bad conduct on the defendant, and it has to be something that's redressable. Well, the, the Charter Amendment specifically states that Orange County citizens can bring actions on behalf of Orange County waterways, which is what Chuck has done. Obviously, lakes can't speak for themselves. There has to be a human being uh, uh, to bring their claim forward, and that's what we have. There's some other technical arguments um, on standing that aren't particularly interesting, but I will say this. Um, I think it's important for everybody to understand that the judge can do three things with the motion to dismiss. She can grant it with prejudice, meaning theoretically the judge could say, I grant the motion to dismiss, um, the complaints dismissed with prejudice, it's done, take your appeal to the fifth district court of appeal. The second thing the judge could do is just deny it outright and say, nope, I disagree. The complaint stands as is. The third thing the judge can do is um, dismiss some or all of it with leave to amend. So, the, And that's very often what happens. So the judge can say, um, I'm going to uh, dismiss, um, you know, count two, uh, but you're allowed to amend it to add something or take something out. And then we would have a time to do that. OK, um, so we have a, a technical argue uh, defense of standing. Um, which is not particularly interesting other than from a very technical legal standpoint. The more interesting topic, which is you guys have mentioned in, your, in the chat room, is constitutional issues. The developer and state DEP say that the preemption statute stands that our constitutional challenges don't have any validity and therefore we don't even get off the ground because the whole thing's preempted by um, section 403.4.12.9, the preemption statute. So I'm gonna, I know this is limited time. I'm gonna try to cover about um, three months in about three minutes here. No, Steve, just to say, we've got plenty of time. Take oh, okay. Your time. Okay, I thought we were at, had an hour. So let me just, I, I'm not gonna be too long-winded, long I hope. But 
this is the you know the brainchild I think of Thomas and Marty and others uh, for years and years, and that's the idea that there's a right to local community self-government. There's a constitutional right that's been taken away by the state regulatory schemes. So we are now stuck at a point where legally we don't even have a basis to try to protect our own drinking water uh, or our, you know our natural water bodies because we're completely dependent on the state DEP, which is an in industry captured regulatory agency. Um, so why do we have a right to local self-government? Um, there's constitutional history and it goes all the way back to the Mayflower, Mayflower Compact of 1620, the Declaration of Independence and the Ninth Amendment and the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitutions. And if we wrap it all up together, what it's saying is that there are certain rights and they may not be specified in the constitution because human beings can't write down every single right that a human being could possibly have, but they're so innate. They're so rooted in the traditions of our country and so fundamentally important that they are still our rights, even if they're not enumerated in the constitution. And one of those rights, if you look at it from a historical perspective, is the right to community, local community self-government. Um, in addition to that, the Florida Constitution, Article 1, Section 1, says all political power is inherent in the people and that the enunciation of certain rights shall not be construed to deny other rights that we retain. So we think we have a constitutional argument um, that, local, that we have a right to pass a charter amendment like this. It's our right as citizens to local community government. The developer and, and state DEP obviously disagree and they essentially say there's no precedent for that. There's no appellate decision supporting that. Just like there were no appellate decisions in Dallas County, Alabama in 1961 that said black people had the right to eat in restaurants uh, alongside of white people. And I would hope to have a chance to argue to the judge that if somebody back in 1961 had gone to their circuit court judge and said, judge, um, I, you know, we want to have the right to eat in a restaurant with everybody else, that the judge would not say back to them, well, you need then to find a statute when none exist or wait for the wait for the Alabama legislature to pass a law that says that and then have Governor George Wallace sign it into law. So as Thomas said, you know, we're kind of on the edge of the universe here. Um, we are, tr you know, let's just be real. We are trying to make new law. And, um, the, you know, one of the things we have to do with the preemption statute is show it's unconstitutional. Um, the second argument constitutionally is it violates the Florida Home Rule uh, uh, constitutional provision. And that's in Article 8, Section uh, 1, Sub G. And essentially what that says is that charter counties like Orange County can pass any laws they want, as long as they don't conflict with general law. General law primarily means state statutes or conflict with the, with the uh, Florida Constitution, okay? So um, in this case, this preemption statute is so broad. I mean, essentially it says that local governments cannot confer any rights on anybody pertaining to the natural environment. And the natural environment is every natural thing, living or dead. It's so broad that it is effectively neutering any of the inherent constitutional uh, power that charter counties have like Orange County. And so therefore it has to be unconstitutional. Um, additionally, credit Thomas and, and Dan Brannon to this argument, the fact that they the fact that the legislature passed this law uh, shortly after it was, uh, uh, the charter amendment was passed, but before the vote, is they're not really just lining up a state statute and saying that conflicts with the charter amendment. They're interfering with the process itself. So they're saying you guys at, at Orange County and, and any local government can't do this process of amending a charter. We're going to preempt you, but you, you can't the legislature cannot pass a statute 
that prohibits something which the state constitution allows. And the state constitution of Florida specifically allows Florida to amend its charter. So that's a, that it's, it's kind of a process constitutional argument. And I think it's brilliant. Um, and that's gonna be part of our argument and, and part of our response. The next part, uh, constitutional argument is the um, natural resources amendment. That's article two, section seven. And what that says is adequate provisions shall be made by law to abate um, air and water pollution and protection of natural resources. Now, what the developer and the uh, state DEP argue is that that's just aspirational. And you, know, you think about it, this is the state Department of Environmental Protection. Their mission is to protect our natural resources. And now they're fighting us on the state constitutional amendment that specifically says that adequate pr provisions must me be made under law to protect our natural resources. It's, it's, it's preposterous. And our argument is that applies not only to the state, but also to the local governments. Orange County has an obligation under um, uh, Article 2, Section 7 to pass laws which and charter amendments if necessary that will abate water pollution and will abate and will preserve the natural resources. And the idea that the State Department of Environmental Protections is fighting that, uh, you know, opposing that is just, it's ironic beyond belief to me. Um, next, um, we have some kind of technical arguments. One is that the, the preemption statute is void for vagueness. That's a 14th amendment argument. We're debating whether we're gonna uh, keep it in our argument uh, for various reasons. But essentially, it says that any law passed has to be understandable by an ordinary citizen. You know, Chuck's a Duke grad, uh, double major math and public policy. And he and I have talked about this for hours, and we still don't really understand it. So I think if, you know, a Duke grad can't understand it, then, you know, the average bear out there is going to have problems with it. Um, there are some technical arguments that, you know, it primarily is using criminal cases, um, not civil cases. So it, uh, I you know, we're, we're debating whether, whether we're gonna keep it in. Uh, the um, next argument is that they didn't have a clear intention. Uh, the legislature didn't clearly intend, give an express intention that they wanted to preempt a particular field because nobody can understand the damn thing. At least I can't. What field are they preempting? Um, so that's, a, that's a, a legal requirement, a statutory requirement in Florida. Um, and we're challenging that. And then the final thing, is a single subject rule. And that essentially says that, um, that's a Florida Constitution rules, the Florida Constitutional provision as well, that says you can only have one subject um, in legislation, and that is to make sure the public and, and the people voting know what they're getting. And in this case, the bill was 111 pages, um, the Clean Water Act. It was mostly about um, septic tanks and waste management and bottled water. And then on one page, they threw in this paragraph about um, rights of nature, preempting rights of nature. So um, those are the constitutional arguments. And then real quickly, because I, I know I've been talking a long time here, but the um, they have an argument that we have not exhausted administrative remedies. In other words, they're saying, you guys should have gone to state DEP first, filed your, your um, uh, challenge with state DEP, and then went through the um, division administrative hearings through an administrative procedures act, um, which, which are kind of quasi judges. Um, and then after that, you could ta have taken, you know, a, a, taken this action to a real court. Our essential argument against that is this is not uh, an agency action. This is a um, lawsuit that in which we're actually asking for a declaration of rights on a county ordinance. There's nothing in the state regulatory scheme that addresses or has a mechanism to address adjudication on a, the constitutionality and validity of charter amendments and how they're applied. So it doesn't make any sense. Um, the second part of our response to the administrative uh, failure to exhaust administrative remedies is that it would be futile because 
the uh, delegation from the Army Corps of Engineers to state DEP for the dredge and fill permitting was incomplete and invalid. In other words, we have a federal statute, the Clean Water Act, that has requirements that the Army Corps is supposed to follow, you know, ha ha, but they're in the statute. And they include things like the, before the Army Corps can grant a wetlands permit, the Army Corps is supposed to consider local land use laws and local public policy and interest. When the Trump administration uh, handed over the responsibility uh, of the Army Corps to state DEP, DeSantis administration, guess what happened? They left out major portions of the, the uh, required analysis before they can grant a wetlands permit. And it included consideration of local interest for crying out loud. I mean, talk about gutting the entire mission of the Clean Water Act. Um, and that is the subject of the Center for Biological Diversity versus US EPA case, which is pending in the DC district, federal district court. Um, so that's sort of a long rambling summary, um, you know, of, of where we are. If, if we um, procedurally, if the judge dismisses with prejudice, which is the worst case scenario, that means we're out, then we would take an appeal to the fifth district court of appeal. Uh, the time frame on that, um, typically cases in Florida are up on appeal for about a year to two years. Let's say eight months to two years, eight months to two and a half years. Um, and then potentially uh, there would be an appeal to the Florida Supreme Court off of that, which is the same kind of time frame. Um, if the judge didn't, if the judge grants the motion to dismiss in part or allows us to amend, then we would amend the complaint and then we would have another hearing. And at some, you know, probably this is a case that can be decided uh, completely uh, as a matter of law. But I would like to get it past that point where we could actually do some discovery and um, you know, take some depositions of the developer and some scientists um, and hydrologists and show you know, how much you know, absolute destruction and havoc these people are wrecking in our waterways. That's it. Steve, thank you very much. I mean, there's so much in there um, and we are, we're well, going about 15 minutes past the hour on this because we started a few minutes late. So I want to thank you for walking us through it. Um, just to get back to that question about um, your in court, you discussed a little bit about what happens um, moving forward. There's the motion to dismiss that's being considered. Um, can you just tell us, you know, sort of in the ideal outcome of this case? What happens? What is this case asking for? You know, just briefly. Um, yeah. If a favorable decision comes on this case, what does that look like in Orange County and I suppose for Florida on the whole? Well, two things in this case. One is that the um, uh, development is stopped. It's enjoined uh, based on the Orange Orange County Charter 704.1, that would be absolutely beautiful because we would have won a major victory for all of rights of nature here. And secondly, that uh, the preemption statute is declared unconstitutional. So they can't monkey up other, you know, uh, rights of nature um, efforts that are going on right now. Um, so those two things would be the ideal outcome for us. Okay. Um, and just so we're, you know, folks following this case, especially after watching this today, can you just, so that we can kind of have our antenna up, um, like sort of what the next six months potentially look like for the case? Yeah, um, well, we've got our April 26 motion to dismiss it, it, you know, depending on what the judge does, if she grants part of it or all of it with leave to amend, usually we would have 20 to 30 days to do that. Um, and then you know, depending on what's left in the case, there may or may not be formal discovery. Um, there probably would be a renewed motion to uh, definitely would be a renewed motion to dismiss based on the new complaint. Um, you know, and 
then potentially a motion for summary judgment at some point after that, which would be probably out outside of six months in which um, the judge would, you know, consider certain evidentiary aspects of the case and, and make a ruling from that. And then eventually a trial. Um, but you asked in the last, in the next six months, probably we're still going to be in either the motion to dismiss stage um, or we're going to be on appeal to the fifth district court of appeal. Thank you. Um, so I fear we have run out of time. Um, so I want to thank Steve for all of that. Chuck, for your presentation. Thomas, for your PowerPoint. This has been really, um, really informative. I think it's very important. And from the questions, which I know we didn't get to all of them, um, people should feel free to get in touch with us. You know, there is Speak Up Archiva. Thomas is putting into the chat different ways to get in touch with us. The work that Steve, Chuck, Thomas, all of you are doing, it's so important. I think I just find it inspiring just to be able to have this kind of discussion and seeing it being so productive within Florida, particularly. I know a lot of people from outside Florida are looking at this as well. Um, so I want folks to understand this has been recorded. Many of you asked, how do we share this? We're going to be, um, as Thomas mentioned, we're going to be having this recording available. We're going to have it up on our website. We'll put it on social media. We'll send it to everyone who's registered today. Please share it. Um, we'll also have the PowerPoint as a standalone document that people can download and look at at our website as well. Please share it. We do. We agree. We think this is really, really critical. Um, this first case, this first rights and nature enforcement case in the United States. Um, and so many, many thanks to Steve, to Chuck, to Thomas, for all three of you for taking some time and sharing this with us. And for everybody who's joining us today, thank you so much for taking your time um, to learn about this. We look forward to being in touch. We will be sharing the recording, the PowerPoint, the chat. I know a lot of people are asking about the chat. We'll share that separately as well, so you can all have it. Um, and with that, I wanna just say thank you. Thank you all so much for all that you're doing. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again soon on a future event webinar. Thanks everybody.